everyone, and welcome to the 14th season of the Milwaukee Poetry Series. Thank you all for watching this whenever you are able to see it. We are really excited about the season, and this particular reading has been a long time in coming. Our season goes tonight through July, and we're going to have six readings. The first three readings, starting with John's tonight, are the three readings that we needed to cancel last spring, April, May, and June, when the pandemic hit. So we were able to reschedule them, and we're starting it tonight, even though this is a virtual reading. So this is, a, this is our first virtual reading, and it's something that we're really excited about. There is a flyer of the poster, and it's something that's available on the email invitation that went out, and also for, from the Letting Library. Or what you can do is put something on the chat, and you can indicate if you would like to have it sent to you by putting your email on it and your name. So we will be able to get them out to people who want them. It's been a difficult time, and we hope that you are all safe and well. Before I introduce John, let me say some thanks. The first thanks to the city of Milwaukee for their support for the Milwaukee Poetry Series. Secondly, for the Lenning Library, because we have been a committee of the Lenning Library really since the beginning. And the Lenning Library has been very supportive and we appreciate it. Finally, thirdly, is the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee, which is active and supportive. And as I've said many times, I think many maybe have heard me, that you don't have something happen unless you have a group of people working on it. And finally, we want to thank Willamette Falls Media. Uh, we are here in the studio recording this. John is going to be reading from home, but we are here. And a big thanks to Willamette Falls Media for everything that they have done to make this possible. And now, to introduce our reader tonight, which we're very happy to have him here. John Sibley Williams is the author of As One Fire Consumes Another, winner of the Horizon Poetry Prize 2019. Skin's Memory, winner of the Backwaters Prize, University of Nebraska Press 2019. A 23-time Pushcart nominee, John is the winner of numerous awards including the Wabash Prize for Poetry, the Philip Booth Award, the Phyllis Smart Young Prize, and Laux Miller Prize. He serves as editor of the Inflectionist Review and works as a freelance poetry editor and literary agent. Previous publishing credits include Yale Review, North American Review, Midwest Quarterly, Southern Review, Sycamore Review, Prairie Schooner, Saranac Review, The Atlanta Review, The Tri-Quarterly, and various anthologies. So you can visit him at his website, johnsibleywilliams.com. So join me, please, in welcoming our poet for that evening, John Sibley Williams.
word so cavernous, her entire body vanishes into it. Body of misfiring electrons, scattered images, no contexts. Body that is mainly just a body now. No other animal knows how to be this incomplete. I think if you were a box, coyotes would have eaten you by now. But I say, yes, mom, I'll climb into that box and let you pull me through the high grass one more time. <clears throat> so, um, so uh, I, I think I'm going to start the reading um, with some uh, po uh, poems from this little book here, Skin Memory, uh, which came out in 2019 uh, for the University of Nebraska Press, won their, uh, their prize. And I'm going to start with a few of these. Um, in this first one, I lived in Oregon for the past 12 or so years, but I'm from the East Coast. So back as a kid, the West, the mythic West was this, you know, just this, this big, impossible mythical thing. Um, and this poem is called, It Was a Golden Age of Monsters. The sickle moon bobs like a, a child's paper boat between silhouettes of paper mountains. I am watching steam swell up a herd of bison in a black and white book about the American West. Too young to read much into what I'm reading. The world is all image, unfinished rail track in Douglas fir, level saw cuts, rings tracing back to the beginning. The dozen spears projecting from a felled paper beast are replaced the next chapter by rifles in iron in that same kind of fall. Tomorrow it will snow and my father will drive me down to the hospital again. Snowflakes crazing about our headlights. Paper moon up there between the mountains. I will be thinking about bison, blood on the page, not the pillow. The road that curls home always seems to erase itself. And the steam coming off it, frail as breath. definitely have a lot of this, um, one of the common themes that shows up through, uh, probably all my, most of my poems, I think, uh, a lot of times, uh, the past and the present, uh, culturally, in terms of family, um, in terms of loss, um, and this next poem, similar but a little different, another one of the, my more common themes, I think, is the idea of casting a certain eye, a judgmental eye, but also an understanding eye on the past, being honest about where we come from. Uh, and this poem is called Symptoms of Shelter. And naturally, as a white, cisgender, able-bodied male, um, you could say I know a lot about growing up privileged and with shelter. So this poem is called Symptoms of Shelter. If I could reconcile the fullness of the moon, of the black oak tonight's moon illuminates, with the bodies I've seen in photographs hanging from an oak at night in just this light. There are only so many perfect moments allowed us. Why must they all end with the sky constricting, bleeding, the trees emptying of birds. Buckshot in the distance, dog bark and good night. Everywhere the dead and nothing to be done. This familiar field now going strange. How lucky I have been to love and love this blindly.
Um, this next poem uh, is based on the last few lines of a very famous poem, one of those poems from some years back that, was it from? Yeah, from, oh my gosh, he wrote it in 1979. It's a Mark Strand poem called Keeping Things Whole. It's one of those poems 20 some odd years ago that, that I read and it really, it changed what I thought literature could be and helped introduce me to poetry. So I'm gonna read Mark Strand's very short poem. It's called Keeping Things Whole. In a field, I am the absence of feel. This is always the case. Wherever I am, I am what is missing. When I walk, I part the air and always the air moves in to fill the spaces where my body has been. We all have reasons for moving. I move to keep things whole. Uh, thank you, Mark Strand. And those last lines, we all have reasons for moving. I move to keep things whole. That really is what this poem is about. And you'll see the last lines of this poem are in reference to that. <clears throat> there is still something thin to swing from madly over the glory faded cottonwood. A different kind of rope and not sure and a different purpose. But our limbs haven't changed much, all ascent and greed. The sky yielding just enough of itself to urge us higher. They say there's nothing left to worship. And I'd agree, if not for the dust kicked up, every slow, steady swipe we take at Eraser. What our grandfathers said their fathers did. The haunted house of our bodies creaking open, almost forgiven. Lately, the dead calm of a summer by the lake where someone told me someone once hung a child for loving another child has lost its grace. What we say to the fire in our lungs doesn't change. It's the same tree. I'd assume we throw the same shadow, long and dark, over its grasses and stone. We all have reasons, Mark. I hope I am swinging to remember. And thank you, Mark. And uh, I think I'm going to read, yeah, just one more thing from this particular book. So um, partway through here, there is a multi-section, uh, kind of a longish poem called Dear Nowhere. Um, so each very brief section is a different location. So there's a Butte, Montana, somewhere in North Texas, uh, along the Inside Passage in Alaska, uh, Ames, Iowa. So a bunch of places either that I've been to or places I'm um, doing some cross-country driving in the past, things like that. Um, so I'm just going to read, I think, probably three or so sections from this. The first one is Cheyenne, Wyoming. Boy on the threshold of song. Boy swallowed up by a flannel, two sizes too large in a mountain of dust from cars returning east. Boy made up almost entirely of stone in summer, broad, empty sky, osprey, owl, hard, brown bread. Boy hawking horses whittled from cedar alone beneath a rusty tin roof with one wall that from the rear view papers off to the point of never having been there at all. Uh, and that is a, a, a real world experience, I guess you could say. And for me, part of it is how important it is <laughs> as, as human beings, but especially as creators, um, 
that we really have to take in our surroundings and really appreciate everyone and everything around us. And that I'm sure this happens to every single one of us, but you're driving down the road and there's someone on the side of the road selling something. And just that brief moment, just drive right by them. In that brief moment, I saw this young boy in the rear view mirror while I was going back to my safe, my, you know, my safe, privileged suburban home. And I drive by and I catch him in the rear view, and for that split second of seeing him in that rear view, suddenly he's a part of my life from that brief moment. And I wrote this poem about that. And I think it's very easy to take for granted everyone that we pass by on the street, but every single one has a poem in them, even if they don't know it. Uh, this next poem, or section, Duluth, Minnesota. Pipe smoke and thin strips of fly paper, citronella, red swollen skin. A hesitancy of a light struggles through night clouds. And where once the stars, stories, we are passing around our pasts like whiskey. Then comes the whiskey, smooth and unquestionable myth. Three sizes larger than truth, the morning's catch of walleye and salmon. The fight still going on in the elk head above us. Our shadows lengthening across a lawn that ends in the lake. And somewhere out there in the dark, past the lake, another country. And finally, uh, Yellowstone National Park, Wyoming. Bison thrum, the darkness breathes and spear tips flicker in the firelight. There's bull elk implied or aspen sharpened by shadow, flame with a circle of stones to temper it. The disembodied words of Whitman and Cormorant returning. On the wind, my mother before I knew her, or just after. Vaguely, in the distance, waters fall and waters crash the sound of everything I failed to keep safe and home. Um, so, um, yeah, so if, I guess we have to do that today. Some of your readings these days, right? So if anyone's interested, just so you know, this is from, those poems are from Skin Memory. Uh, so, I have been lucky enough. Um, I don't know what's going on this week. Um, just I had two new, brand new manuscripts uh, that I just started submitting in November, and four or so days ago, uh, I got a note that it that one manuscript, the Drowning House, um, had won the Elixir Press Poetry Award. So uh, new book, yay! Thank you. Um, and then a few days later, yesterday, I got a call from the uh, Cider Press Review saying that my other manuscript, Scale Model of a Country at Dawn, won their book award. So I think I'm going to have two new books coming out in the next, uh, around the same time, probably. I think around, you know, December, January or so. Um, so I've never read almost any of these poems before. So unlike the last poems where I could close my eyes and read most of them from memory, uh, I cannot do that here. But I'm excited. To, I'm excited to read these. Um, so I'm going to read some poems from *The Drowning House*. <clears throat> and this first poem is called *Counter Glow*. Consider the meteorite, 110,000 pounds of debris that hollowed out Wolf Creek Crater. How Oppenheimer's boldest nightmares couldn't concoct the kind of ruin that vanishes a sky for years. How anything can become a tourist attraction. Can 
consider what we do to ourselves when the one person we love renounces our touch. Consider angels, my grandmother used to say, and how you never know which saves and which consumes us. Whatever you believe, how it all comes down to flame. There's too much written about the end. Pale horses and rogue nukes and the smaller gods of reserve and lukewarm bath water. When I consider each meal is someone's last, am I meant to lose my appetite or keep dragging my fork over this empty plate, never sated? Consider how we become our own conclusion, how what we've hung out to dry remains crucified, how believing these things beautiful might not make them so. Consider how rivers multiply into oceans, a few misplaced words, and now the bombs have their wings. And so much goddamn waiting as if we have to imagine what nooses do to next. Consider what's been redacted from life to make all this anguish seem in art. <clears throat> Uh, the next, um, I'm not sure if anyone that is a real place, uh, the Wolf Creek Crater in Australia. Um, quite a, quite a sight for those who've seen it. So this, uh, this next poem, I'm excited to say it's going to be, just found a few weeks ago, this is going to be the first time that I've been in the, uh, that annual Best American Poetry Anthology, and it was for this poem, which I'm, um, very honored about. <clears throat> so this poem is called The Dead just need to be seen, not forgiven. That old man in the photo our family never talks about, known best for tracking runaway slaves. Tonight we drag him from the basement up these loose wood stairs and set out a plate of salted cabbage and rabbit. So long since I've asked why the empty chair at our table. With all the warmth the body has to give, we give up on measuring the darkness between men. Dust and dusk enter and are wiped from the room. The names we call each other linger, luminous and savage. Still, that tree I used to hang tires from holds tight its dead centuries. The light swinging from its branches we call rope-like, which implies there's no longer rope. Tonight, will wash the burnt out stars from his hair, all the crumbs from his beard. The misfired bullet of his voice we let burn as it must. <clears throat> Definitely one of my goals in that and quite a few poems across, I guess all, all, all these books and stuff. I think a lot of, a very common theme is for me definitely is that idea of trying to connect the past and present and to look at the past yes absolutely with judgment but also to to recognize it to bring it into the present to see what it means to us now and to see what lessons we've learned from it and to see what lessons we have not learned from it and i would the last handful of years um, um have perhaps leaned um into the not quite learning certain lessons category. Uh, this, other, this, this next poem, uh, similarly, I, I, I hope speaks to that. I have a whole series of poems um, in, the, in this upcoming book, The Drowning House, and a few poems from some of the other books, where I try to take uh, two different individuals, 
sometimes in this case a, a historical figure and an artist or something like that and kind of pair them and try to write a poem that speaks to both of them. In this case, it's Emmett Till and then slash slash the title, Edward Hopper. In your mouth, a thousand unpainted churches, steeples snapped off like baby teeth in an apple, rusted bells trying so hard to ring, ringing, crows along your restless edges where clapboard meets sky and storm. The sky is always storming. Skin can be its own broken republic. Everywhere, overgrown rail tracks and a few white people who don't know what to say to each other. Not anymore. Truth is married to the surface of things. The surface is a lighthouse overlooking wreck after wreck. No ships here anymore. Nothing left to cradle and swing safely into harbor. All sorts of things swing. All sorts of women sit on the knife's edge of a bed half-naked, staring out a half-naked window. All sorts of men are tossed over bridges after whistling a little tune. Come back, crows, bells, edges. In you, let the night see its face. <clears throat> So maybe you uh, heard in that for those familiar with Edward Hopper. I think I have about four or five-ish uh, paintings of his, images from four or five paintings of his that I tried to weave in through. And one thing, uh, the, the images that are, are more are uh, that have people in them uh, seem to be a lot of very emotionally disconnected white people staring blankly at each other at windows, at walls. And there was something about the, the, the beauty of his work and the kind of narrative hidden beneath his work that seemed to make so much more sense with the atrocity um, that happened to Emmett Till so many decades ago. Um, <clears throat> so this next poem, this is a, this is a long title. Harps, and this is just the title is actually a line from a poetry book called Ghost of which came out from Omnidon Press, it's a great press, a couple of years back. Um, and it's uh, Diana uh, Nguyen. Um, the poem is called Future Self. So that's just the, the title is from that. I just love this line. Harps strung with gut still make music after 2,000 years. 12 unpaired shoes hang windless from a wire threading streetlights together. Uh, eventually swallows reclaim them. Without the need for twig and try, raise a family in our cavities. My son points a toy gun to my temple. Each bang reminds me my father was once a mountain that crumbled beneath me, how the sheer terror of cradling so much weightlessness can flatten landscapes, raise cities, or the birds remind me, return warmth to discarded things. That there is nothing that is not home hurts more than the imagined bullet drilling into my skull. I cannot fail to forgive it. As he tightens his tiny lips and blows through me, finally, I am song. <clears throat> oh yeah, 
haven't heard any of these out loud before. Um, another desert poem. I like my desert poems. This next poem is called Self Portrait with Mojave. White as a picked of hard cattle skull, clean and sober as it's dismantling. Our eyes grown accustomed to seeing ghosts seek out other kinds of horror. Enormous horse hides fill the walls. A Winchester rides high over pictures of a blacked and whited history. The people who've called this place home longer than we've been Americans saw outside a gas station sipping at bottles we gave them in compensation, in apology. As kids, we dragged the shed part of snakes home to decorate a stone mantle that never needed to know fire. How we'd light it anyway to let the land know we are not going anywhere. How we let the water cupped in our hands escape back to the basin and think that thirst. Mm. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll read two more uh, poems that are from uh, from the upcoming John House here. Uh, this next poem, uh, like one of them earlier, one of the poems earlier, this next poem is uh, one of those where there's annoying poems in terms of reading it out loud, where the title is also the first line. <laughs> so, <clears throat> everything here is beautiful and full of throng. You can tell by how far a lie must travel down string into paper cup to reach the ear as true. How we recognize a starling best when a song is absent. How everything that comes to rest eventually comes to rest in precisely the right place. A boy buried beneath the rubble of a blown up building can tell you the sky, suffocated and leaden, leading nowhere, has hoarded all its light up just for him. A gut shot doe will drag its limp limbs miles to a particular opinion's shade. Maybe everything is just too damn close. From very far away, how the massive mountains shadowing the town and the town and our bodies equally slight. <clears throat> um, and the final poem from this manuscript. <clears throat> ah, it is uh, one of my... Um, I only have a few of them, but oh, one of my, uh, I guess you could say quarantine or pandemic poems, something that's come up uh, recently in a few poems, is fears of how I'm, we're raising our children, what gets passed down, um, especially to my son, um, things like that, what gets passed down generation. That scares me. And now the new thing, of course, that's uh, worrying me is having, you know, for raising four-year-olds to be afraid of strangers. You know, someone is within 20 feet of you, put that mask on. No, no, we can't even walk down an empty city street. Oh, there's a playground, put your hand sanitizer on, don't touch, don't go over to the neighbor's house anymore. Um, and I'm wondering about how that's going to, to, to change them, to be raised that way. Um, so this poem is called Self-Portrait as Lacuna, which is the, you know, the whole. What do we do with a body severed from other bodies? With a child who cannot weave herself into and out of embrace? When the plastic stars glued to her ceiling supplant the celestial, Dreams and hungers cast only so high, 
prayers smacked hard against drywall in blue paint. Into the burn barrel out back, everything I hoped would someday wear her name. Family, only a state away, already dimming to memory. Only my face to remind her of her own. A miniature dollhouse world prematurely on fire. This afflicted air, breath, when breathing becomes the barbed fences between neighbors. Cover yourself, love, please. It is my splintered cross to keep you safely distanced from humanity. Here, another promise I didn't mean to break. Here, another kiss as apology. A board book to show what it was like before. Talking animals to prove the world can be wildly unquiet and innocent. A sky made up of myths and, and stars, honest to goodness stars, all gas and flame and unobstructed whimsy. Here is someone else's tree to carve your initials into. Here, love, here's the tree of my body to learn to climb. Far from here, far from me, to touch whatever is still up there, beautifully above us. Mm. Mm. All right. So, um, just for for fun, I am. Uh, I think. Yeah, I'm gonna read two brand new, meaning written in the past few days, poems. I don't normally do this, but I'm kind of excited to do so. Um, so I'm going to start with a poem that I, ooh, 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 I wrote this morning. Uh, I'm sure like many of you, uh, with everything being close, unless maybe some of you write at home, personally, I need distraction in order to focus. So I usually write at a uh, cafe, uh, if it's nice weather, doors, uh, you know, at parks, things like that. Um, so, because all you know, things are closed, you know, I don't want to be around people. I've been writing all my poems sitting, doesn't matter the weather, pouring rain, absolutely freezing, sitting in a car in a strip plaza parking lot in front of a hardwood flooring store so they can get in there. That's where I've been writing my poems recently, and it turns out it's, it's just fine. Like, apparently, I can write there. <laughs> um, sometimes, uh, sometimes I think a little bit of claustrophobia ends up showing up in some of these poems. Um, so this poem I just wrote this morning, and maybe you can tell me in comment sections or email me to say if it's any good or not. We'll see. The title, currently, not 100% sure, the title is Human Hours. Another lung collapses. Soot blackens an already unlit interior. Somewhere between flight and fall, a man I will eventually resemble once I've scrubbed these stars from my eyes, breaks down at a kitchen table between generations that struggle to want to hold him. Too many birds to count constellate on the naked branch outside. Outside, he interrogates a winter woodpile with an axe that fails to split his questions open into answers. No, into, maybe, into, just this once, into, please. My children cut and paste his name on a poor, onto a poorly folded paper crane and dance it wildly in the cigar-heavy air. A body's length away, a body begins its thinning. Music from a tinfoil antenna holds back our silence, sweeps 
gives static up in its mighty arms and sways it across the lawn. Shallow prints, deepening snow. That wartime frigate, every night he weeps over privately, that's reached us as flame and fist sets out to bloody or save another country. And the axe too heavy to lift, and the crane with his name beating itself against the window to rejoin the birds outside. So let me know if that, that poem is worth anything. <laughs> Usually I give the poem a few days, and then I reread it, but I thought I really wanted to read that stuff. <clears throat> okay. So I think I'm, I'm going to read these three little poems, if I may. From the, These three poems are from um, the other manuscript that just yesterday, thank you to everyone at uh, Cider Press Review, uh, that... that um, this, this collection is called Scale Model of a Country at Dawn. And this is just it won their uh, book award. I think it's coming out in January. Um, so just three little poems from that. Um, this first one is called Our Pasts Like Lighthouses. And it begins with a quote from Langston Hughes. Today, you will write about lights. <clears throat> I saw the sign scuffed and hooked over a boarded up door frame, freed from meaning only open or closed, doctor or butcher, just a beautifully blank face, gone all impartial and true. Each brick shattered window its own cathedral, I, finally, with history holstered, the barrel but lukewarm, the fossils of fallen stars have a chance to shine again, to be dusted off and to dust our future ancestors. My daughter, for example, how little her skin resembles mine. How if this were 1944, she and her brother would be displaced in Minidoka or Manzanar or Harmony. Harmony. How she loves to say that word without the weight of context. How like a lighthouse, she scans every goddamn corner of her safe little sea in search of some wreck to save to guide back into a harbor. Today is my heart. Love, thank you for that. And for this rotted old wooden sign, briefly, we will leave our names on. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Minidoka, yeah. Uh, Manzanar and Harmony, those were intern Japanese internment camps um, during World War II because my, cause my uh, children's uh, um, half heritage. Um, and that's been showing up quite a bit, actually, for one reason or another in my New York Times. <clears throat> All right, so this next poem from the upcoming collection, uh, this poem is called Imprint. Uh, it begins with a Kate Chopin um, quote, which is, there are some people who leave impressions not so lasting as the imprint of an oar upon water. What a beautiful quote. For, for example, breath. For example, a father. Or a dawn shooting up fireflies, raking the stars down to campfire ash. The child you'll spend longer grieving than raising. The sea's clumsy mirror. 
the churchlessness of raw earth. For example, that inevitable first footprint sunk into the river clay of an unmapped country. Heaven or hell or just another Sunday wandering the wild outskirts of a fenceless field. How everything is entirely unknowable until ripped from the earth and tasted. Spit back, sometimes swallowed. I'm done trying to breathe life back into imaginary dead things. My hands, for example. How much more you must have expected from them. <clears throat> Um, last poem from this upcoming manuscript, um, uh, 1986. I remember seeing the uh, Challenger. If anyone is old enough to remember that, I'm dating myself now. Uh, the Challenger explosion was live on television in the classroom. My goodness. This poem is called Canaveral. Cape Canaveral. Some things are damned to flare up before breaching the surface of space. Umbilical, umbilical smoke as it continues the trajectory, like a giant white kanji character brushed onto the air. Like a parasite projected from its microscopic plate against the heavens. One after another mother covering her child's wet and widening eyes. Tendrils of doubt, notes jotted into the margins of how the world really works. When you stop making lists of why the reasons distill, refine in our pure that we will do it all again. Repetition as worship, as eventually adding up to something. Above this one is another sky shot full of holes. <clears throat> so I haven't read the vast majority of those poems out loud before. I hope I didn't okay job. And if you saw me something going, I, I, uh, my children just suddenly walked in the door and went, Dad, Dad, so I apologize. Um, yeah, time wise, I think there's only a, you know, a few, just a few more minutes. It's about, so I'm going to read just a, a few quick poems, um, if I may, from. Can you see it? As One Fire Consumes Another, which also came out in 2019. Um, and, and I'm honored to uh, say won the uh, Orson Poetry Prize. Beautiful. Uh, Orson uh, Books is a, an amazing publisher. Um, so there will be a couple of quick poems from here. Uh, this first poem is called Pinata. And again, in some ways deals with masculinity, fears of masculinity, and things passing down. So Pinata. Body broken into all the sweetness torn out Brightly dyed paper flakes linger in the grass as if someone has sanded down the sun. The husk of an animal hangs loosely from a sky clouding over in storm. Tomorrow, he will be a man. Until then, sticks are just sticks. Thrashing the insides out of some martyred paper beast. It's just play. Lollipop, marzipan, tamarind. Fire works its way up the arm, into bottle rocket, into bang. The sky glimmers and is gone. And whatever the boys can carry home between their teeth will be theirs. <clears throat> is one of the many reasons <laughs> why we have never had a, well, a pinata for our kids' birthdays. Um, yeah. 
I have, some of these poems have been a little sad. I'm gonna read one of the very few poems that isn't particularly sad. Uh, this is called Grace Notes. We are driving west with the sun swaddled in storm cloud and all that pristine nothingness that is Kansas flattening behind us. I've learned there are ways to sing along to radio silence. Though I'm less convinced these days anyone is listening. How quickly winter empties our voices of their animals. Windows down and the gray horizon suddenly too small to carry inside us. You are the worst kind of a lover, highway. Landlocked between fled and imagined homes. As our headlights, like slowly falling fires, kick out into the afternoon rain, and the kids from the back seat start naming everything that blurs by us birds. And suddenly, birds again, we begin making Motown of the dead air. I have no idea what I promised them about tomorrow. But the sky is devastating as whirling white asters. And no clouds will ever make these wild animal shapes again. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I, uh, I think, uh, okay. I guess, yeah, that's maybe two, three more poems, if I may, uh, indulge. So this next poem um, is uh, kind of playing with, um, in some ways, uh, so with my children, uh, in some ways playing with the gender norms, which is interesting because my children, uh, are very much the polar opposite of the traditional or stereotypical gender roles. Um, this poem is called Sovereignty. 200 green plastic army men circle around a tea set. All the matchbox cars are up on blocks in the yard. While my daughter's dolls wage wars on the flamingos basking in a flagpole swollen shadow. The mowers making birdshot of each dandelion head. For once, summer is what it seems. A trick of the light, a mistranslation, a castle of air. And all fathers are invented gods. And now I am a father inventing a world where matchstick sailboats can set the entire ocean ablaze. My children take turns pulling me around our safe green box of earth in a red wooden wagon. It doesn't take much to convince the sky that we have no idea how to hold it. Mm. Um, you know what? I'm not going to do, I'm going to do a, you know, I don't know if this is a half the poem, but something like that. It's playing with the, the gender again. This poem is called Understudies. <clears throat> In our parents' bedroom, exchanging overalls for ties, bras. I am playing mother again and Tyler. For those 10 minutes between breakfast and church, you can be dad's hard open palm. Both your feet drown in his shiny black Sunday shoes. It takes time for the world to whiten around the temples, to scar. You are trying and failing to find something awful enough to pray away. 
stuffing your big boy pockets with miracles that sound like stopped watches. Now hold me how they say they held each other once. Tell me how pretty I was when your arms first danced my waist around a crowded Elks Lodge to a song that ended in two sons and a need to atone. And I will show you how to be forgiven without asking the sky. How to love without using your mouth. I'm not sure if that's a positive moment or not. Um, so um, I just, I'm going to just do one more poem um, before you. Some banging going on back there. I apologize. Uh, kids are building something. I don't know. Um, so thank you uh, again. I want to say to, to Tom for the invitation. I'm sorry I didn't get to see you in person. It is a shame. You are a, a great supporter of our local poetry community. And, uh, and to Joshua for the te for everything tech stuff, and to the Letting Library, my library. I live in Milwaukee, and I can't wait to be back and see you once the disease is subsided. So thank you so much. I'm just going to read one more quick poem, uh, and I guess to do the uh, commercially stuff, because I want to just end on the poem, and that's it. Um, if you're interested at all, I think Tom had mentioned it, but just my website is johnsonbluewilliams.com. Easy enough. But also, book stuff is there, news, that the newsletter, all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're interested, you know, Paul's books or, or Barnes & Noble or I don't know, whatever you do, all the local bookstores here, but Amazon, Target, whatever you do, prefer not Amazon or Target, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, if you're ever interested in those, let me know. If you want a signed copy, I'll just shoot me an email. My email's on the website. Um, and, and, and that'd be lovely. I'm um, sorry I don't get to see any of you, your faces. It feels very odd just reading to myself in a room. Ah, this, so this next, uh, our final poem, I should say, I, this is a poem that I, I know my readings on. I probably always will. Uh, this poem is called The Crossing. Uh, I really thought this wasn't going to be an issue anymore after I read this book, but the last number of years have been talking otherwise. The Crossing. Tell me, tell me what not to do with the heaven-faced children torn between parents who are torn apart by a river, tearing a long, muddy scar into this long and lengthening landscape. Then tell me again why we are the only animals bound by maps, shifting allegiances. Tell me what not to forgive of the stars. What color skin my skin is forbidden to touch. What heart my heart cannot possibly hold without breaking. Don't tell me the best way to break a body without damaging its shell. We all know how that story ends. Ask the bridled horses. Ask mothers waiting on docks for warships never to return. Ask any long, cold winter night in any part of any country that any child has ever fled to find herself no closer to home. Please tell me what road that begins in ruin ends somewhere beautiful. Mm. Um, again, thank you so much, everyone. Be safe. Wear your masks. Should have to say that. And love each other. John, thank you so much for the terrific reading. We really appreciate it. And congratulations. One thing to say to you, congratulations on the prizes for the Drowning House and Scale Model, and congratulations for your inclusion in the anthology. That was just a terrific reading, and it really came across to us. So we appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we will be here with the reading on the second Wednesday of 
March. Until then, thanks for watching. Whenever you see this uh, reading, and we'll see you then. Good night, everybody.